Great Lakes Prepping here. In this video, we're talking about corn. Specifically, preserving your corn to use and enjoy for the entire year. I know I don't have to tell you the importance of food preservation, especially if you grow your own vegetables. Fresh produce doesn't really last all that long for the most part, so we have to do what we need to do to make sure that we can eat it and enjoy it for months to come. So today we're talking about three excellent ways to preserve corn. Now, full disclosure, I didn't grow all of this corn we're looking at right here. I did grow corn, but it certainly didn't produce all of this all at one time. But the farmer's market is in full swing. Prices as well as quality are the best they're going to get all year. So I picked up a whole bunch of corn and we're going to go through some steps to make sure that it lasts. But anyway, the point is that even if you don't grow your own corn, you can still pick up a whole bunch of it at a pretty good price. Of course, you can buy canned corn and frozen corn, but in my opinion, nothing quite beats the taste and the satisfaction of doing it yourself. So let's jump right in and talk about the first way to preserve your fresh corn. Now the first corn preservation method that we're talking about is freezing. This is by far the easiest method and provides absolutely great results. And the best part is, is that you can have whole corn on the cob to enjoy whenever you want. It's a very simple process. And the first thing we're gonna do, of course, is shuck the corn. Now we're not gonna really do much to these cobs of corn. They're not gonna be blanched, cooked, or anything else. But I will say that I like to give them a rinse under the faucet first to get you know, some of the stringy stuff and the silk off of there. But after that, I wanna make sure to dry them pretty thoroughly. I could let them air dry a little while or just sorta of dry them off with a dish towel. And since we can't just stick cobs of corn in the freezer all by themselves, we're gonna do what? Vacuum seal them. Now you can definitely use something like a Ziploc bag, but I do recommend that if you do that, you do your best to squeeze or even suck the air out of that bag the best you can. Some people will use a drinking straw just to kind of suck as much of that air out as they can as they close up the last bit of that bag. If you do use the Ziploc bag method, I would advise double bagging them because you really want to avoid that freezer burn. But if you know me, you know that I love my vacuum sealing machine. And for our corn today, I'm going to be using this sort of narrower vacuum seal bag or rather the roll of make your own bag. You can certainly use the pre-made bags and you can certainly use the much wider bags that would allow you to maybe put three or four corn cobs wide or stack them as deep as you want, uh, sort of perpendicular. But for me, I like putting two corn cobs per bag because that's about a serving size for me. So I'm just gonna use my cobs of corn to kind of measure how long I need to cut this bag. Of course, we need to leave a little extra on both sides so the sealing machine can do its thing. And for these make your own bags, of course, you have to seal the first side before you put anything in it. Now it's as simple as putting our corn cobs in the bag and sealing the other end. Now you see I cut this a little longer than I really needed it to be, but at this point it wouldn't really give me any benefit to trim a little bit of this off, so I'm just gonna leave it like that. And that's all there is to it. I'll go ahead and write the month and year on the bags and stick them in the freezer. And that's where they'll sit until I'm ready to use them. Then you cook them in whatever way that you normally like to cook corn on the cob. Boil them, grill them, bake them, whatever. 
Our second corn preservation method is dehydration. I'm a big fan of dehydrating vegetables because they can be shelf stable for years to come. Devoid of moisture, most vegetables can last a very long time when dehydrated and stored in an airtight container, such as a mason jar. So the first step that I need to do is shuck and clean all of this corn. Now I won't make you sit here and watch me do all that because you know what it looks like, but I'll do the same thing, shuck the corn, give it a quick rinse, and dry them off a little bit. All right, the next thing we have to do is take the kernels off the cob. Now I'll mention that for dehydrating, I do actually cook the corn before dehydrating. I find that it helps them rehydrate a little better. So I could boil these in some water first and then remove the kernels, but I find that doing it before cooking both makes it easier and that I don't have to try to hold a hot cob of corn. And also the kernels are a little more firm and they just sort of slice off a little easier without creating any kind of a mushy mess that you might get when you do it after boiling. So for this, you can use a sharp knife or any one of the number of gadgets that they make specifically for doing this. I'll use my little corn cob peeler shaver thing because I think it works pretty well. Now, if you're wondering if there's a way to do this without making a huge mess, mm, no, not really. Not unless you've rigged up some sort of containment system and maybe a bench mounted corn shaving device. So I'll just accept that there's gonna be kernels everywhere. I might as well make a big mess and then clean it up at the end. All right, now I've got my corn all gathered up and put into my pasta cooking pot, which is great because the whole inner thing here is basically a big colander. So when I wanna remove this from the pot, I can just put the whole thing in the sink and lift this inner pot out. Makes it super easy. But of course, you don't have to have one of those. You can just use a regular pot and then run everything through a colander when it's done. So what I've done is put all the kernels into this pot and sort of just filled it up with enough water to cover it. And now I'm gonna let it come up just about to a boil stir it a couple times, and that's it. We're just sort of partially or mostly cooking it, and that's all we need to do. Then we'll pull it out and let it drain. All right, now that our corn is cooked and drained, the next step is to put it in the dehydrator. And of course, for this, I'm using my Excalibur dehydrator, which I absolutely love. You can certainly use a smaller dehydrator. I just like this one because I can put a lot of stuff in it all at once. And I've got a few of my trays laid out on some dish towels because even though I've strained that corn, it's still gonna have a fair amount of water that needs to drip off. And we'll just let them drip on these trays, on the dish towels for just a little bit. And then we're sticking them into the dehydrator. And since this corn is still pretty hot right now, I'll go ahead and use a slotted spoon to just sort of distribute it over these trays. All right, we've got our corn spread out and it's been just sort of drying on the counter here for a little while, not real long, just a, just a few minutes. And now I'm going to carefully put these trays into the dehydrator. Now you can see that I've removed uh, most of the empty trays that I don't need to use. I only had four trays worth of corn. By spacing them out a little bit, it'll actually dehydrate faster. So I'll get those trays out of there if they're not in use. I'll go ahead and put the cover on the front. So now all I have to do is turn the dehydrator on and leave it alone for several hours. The Excalibur dehydrator has a temperature gauge and I'm setting it at 125 degrees, which is the recommended temperature 
for most vegetables. I'll leave this alone for probably 12 to 18 hours and check on it once in a while between now and then. Depending on the moisture content and size of the kernels, uh, we'll make it take more time or less time. I've had corn take upwards of 24 hours. So we'll pick it back up here when these things are dehydrated. Well, it's been just about 17 hours of running this dehydrator. I think we're, we're pretty good. I probably didn't need to go quite that long, but it was running overnight and so I shut it off when I woke up. So now we just need to sort of carefully take all of the corn off our screens here and put them into something. So I got all my kernels into this baking dish and made sure to kind of wipe off those mesh screens as good as I could to get all my bits of corn. And if you recall, this is 10 cobs of corn right here. It sure takes up a lot less space when it's dehydrated. Now storing this dehydrated corn couldn't be easier. We're going to put it in a quart mason jar and then vacuum seal it. Pull all the air out of there and this thing will be shelf stable for years to come. So that's it, 10 cobs comes out to be, well, about three quarters of a quart. Now it's time to break out the food saver and the mason jar lid attachment. If you haven't seen me use this thing before, it's super cool, very easy to use. What we're gonna do is take the lid for our mason jar, put it on there, carefully sort of put this jar attachment over top, and then we'll hit the vacuum button on the food saver. We don't need to wait for it to seal because it's not actually sealing anything. And to release our jar attachment, we just have to break that uh, suction on the hose. And this thing pulls right off. And now our lid is completely sealed in place. That's it. That's dehydrating corn. And the third method we're going to use to preserve our corn is pressure canning. Because corn is a low acid vegetable, we can't use the regular hot water bath canning method. So we're gonna be pressure canning the rest of our corn in these pint mason jars. Now, if you've never done pressure canning before, the whole thing can seem a little bit intimidating. And it's true, you do have to follow a few directions, both for the success of your canning and for safety. But once you do it once or twice, you'll realize it's not that much more complicated than anything else. But because there are a bunch of steps, I'll try to make sure to cover all of them without necessarily dragging this video on for way too long. So the first thing I have to do, just like with the dehydrating, is shuck a bunch of corn, wash it a little bit, and then cut the kernels off the cob. So I'll do that and skip ahead to when we're ready to start the actual process. So I got the kernels all removed from the cobs and I'm going to give them a bit of a rinse in my big pasta pot here. Now before we go forward, let me talk real quick about hot pack canning versus cold pack canning when it comes to corn. It's completely up to you which one you do. Hot pack canning basically involves cooking the corn first in some water. Pretty much how I did it before I dehydrated my corn in the last part. When you fill your jars, you would fill it with both corn and that water that it was cooking in. For cold pack canning, you fill the jars with the corn and then pour hot water over top. This essentially cooks the corn, as will the pressure canning process itself, but we're not pre-cooking the corn before that. Now, I personally prefer this method. With the cold pack canning, not only is it a little easier and quicker because you can skip that first extra cooking process, but also, in my personal opinion, I think the corn ends up tasting better when you go to eat it later on. Maybe this is because cooking it in all that water ends up somehow cooking out some of the flavor. I'm not really sure, but I think it just works better all around. So I go with the cold pack canning. So 
So now that I've got my corn rinsed and pretty well drained, I just have to let the jars finish sanitizing and then we're ready to start filling them up. Again, I'm using pint jars for this. You can definitely use quart jars. For me, I find that a pint is a little more realistic of a serving for me than a quart. So that's what I'm using. Otherwise, the process is about the same. So we're gonna take our handy canning funnel and just start filling it up with these kernels. Now what we want is to have an inch of head space and that includes when we pour our water over top. And to measure our head space, we'll use our little debubbler and head space measuring tool. Find the one inch mark and just sort of use it as our gauge. It looks like I need a little more. And that's about an inch right there. All right, now it's time to fill these jars up with the water. What we're going for is using water that's just about boiling. And we wanna fill this up till it's just at the top level of those kernels. And I'll just check again real quick with my measuring tool. Make sure that I'm not really Going over that one inch headspace. I think I could stand to take the teeniest bit out of this jar. I'll also mention that if you prefer, you can add some salt to each jar too. For quarts, about a teaspoon. For pints, about a half a teaspoon. It doesn't help with the canning or preservation. It's just flavoring. Personally, I prefer to season my food when I'm actually making it. And since I consider these ingredients rather than like a meal, I prefer to leave it unsalted until I'm ready to use it. Now we'll take our little debubbler measuring tool and debubble. Just kind of work that down around the inside edges, the walls of the jars. What we're looking for is to dislodge any obvious air bubbles that might exist, break those free so they can escape out of the top during the canning. Next, a quick wipe to the top edge of each rim. We want to get any loose corn residue or whatever else off of there so we can have a good seal on those lids. Make sure to go pretty thoroughly on each one to get any little bit that might be on there. I'm using a damp paper towel. Some people use uh, vinegar on a paper towel. For this, I think water's fine. Now it's time for the lids. We'll take our sanitized lids and place them right on top of each jar. And now for the rings. As always, we're gonna go uh, pretty, pretty much finger tight on these. We don't wanna over tighten them. Just the littlest bit snug with, with your fingers. Now these are going into the pressure canner. I'll say that they're very hot at this point because of that boiling water we poured in, so I will use my jar lifter tool to put them into the canner. Okay, let's talk about what we have going on here. This is my granite ware pressure canner. You know, every pressure canner operates a little bit differently, so you definitely wanna familiarize yourself with the directions on yours if you get one. For pressure canning on this one, it calls for putting three quarts of water into the canner and then adding your jars. And you wanna do your best to make sure the jars are sitting flat and not really touching one another and not touching the outside walls of the canner. So now that the water's in, the jars are in, it's time to put the lid on the canner. Now we're just gonna turn it on to high heat. Now this canner has a cool safety feature. When it reaches pressurization, there's a pin that pops up right here that lets you know that it's pressurized. And not only does that let you know that it's pressurized, but it also causes the lid to become locked into place. There's no way that you can take the lid off until it's safe to do so, and that's pretty cool. Now what we need to do is let this 
heat up and start venting. Since there's only a bit of water in there, this is gonna become steam very shortly after the water starts boiling, but it's gonna be a mixture of steam and air. What we want to happen is for basically all of the air to vent out of it, and that'll happen through this little hole right here. Now, once we see basically pure steam just pouring out of this hole in a little, a little jet, we wanna let that go for 10 minutes. That is the venting or exhausting process. It's creating basically a pure steam environment. Once we get to that point, we'll put on our pressure regulator, which is this little thing. Now this goes right on top of the vent here, and depending on the recipe, uh, these need to have different weights. You know, some of the nicer pressure canners have uh, pressure gauges on them. Um, the sort of more simple ones use a weight to determine your pressure. So we've got the regulator and these little metal rings. And basically, if your recipe calls for five pounds of pressure, you just use the regulator. If it calls for 10 pounds of pressure, you gotta slide one of these little things on there. And if it calls for 15 pounds, then you put the second one on there. Our recipe calls for 10 pounds of pressure at my particular altitude, which is just barely above sea level. So no special considerations there. If you do live at high altitude, you do have to check the directions and determine if you need more weight than I do. So this is gonna take a little while to start venting and we'll pick it up when that starts happening. So we still have a few minutes before the venting is complete, but I wanted to show you how it looks when the canner begins to pressurize a little bit and that safety switch engages. You can kind of see it pop up and the steam stops coming out of that particular area. Now, just a few more minutes until we get that steady stream of steam. Okay, now we're at the point where it is venting. We've got a pretty consistent stream of that steam coming out of the vent pipe. So I'll set my timer for 10 minutes. Okay, venting is complete, and now we're going to put on our regulator with the single weight for 10 pounds of pressure. And because there's very hot steam coming out of this, I'm not going to take any chances in putting this regulator in place. At this point, there's a little bit of fine-tuning involved. We want to turn the heat down a little bit, but not too much. What we're going for is having a consistent back-and-forth rocking of that regulator. If the heat's a little too high, the thing will rock a little too violently and erratically. If the heat's a little too low, it won't rock at all. So for the next two, three, four minutes, just kind of watch and adjust the heat a little up and down as you need it till you get that regulator rocking back and forth pretty consistently like you see here. At this point, the processing has begun and we're going to set the timer. For pints, we want to process for 55 minutes at this altitude, which is pretty much zero. If we were doing quarts, we'd process for 85 minutes. All right, our processing has completed and I've turned the heat off and have just been letting this whole thing sit here for a little while to let the pressure go down and let the heat go down a little bit more. I can see that my little safety indicator on the canner has gone back in. I can take my regulator off and we're gonna remove the lid. I'm already hearing the lid start to pop and that's a good sign, that's what I like to hear. Now we're just gonna take out the jars and set them on the counter. So now I'm just gonna leave these jars sit here on the counter for quite some time until they pretty much completely cool to room temperature. Now, if after a while I notice that any of the lids have not popped yet, that is to say I could still push them down with my finger or remove the lids quite easily, then that means I have to assume that that particular jar did not successfully can. That's okay, it doesn't mean my corn's ruined, it just means that I need to use it uh, pretty soon or put it in the fridge and use it within the next few days. But assuming that the canning was successful, these things are ready, they're done. They're ready to uh, be labeled with the date and stored in the pantry, of course, with the, the rings removed. And that's it, that's pressure canning. So there we have it, our three ways to preserve your corn harvest. Real quick, let's talk about some of the pros and cons for freezing, dehydrating, and pressure canning. For freezing corn, the obvious benefits to this method are that it's the easiest and quickest. There's really no preparation other than shucking the corn and sticking them in the freezer bags and vacuum sealing 
takes pretty much no time at all. This corn will last almost indefinitely in the freezer. And I really like this method because it allows you to preserve whole corn on the cob. As far as cons, well, the obvious one is that it requires constant electricity. They'll stay preserved as long as your freezer stays frozen. And the only other con is that you have to wait for them to thaw before you eat. Dehydrating. The pros are that it's shelf stable and for a really long time. If completely dehydrated and stored properly, it'll be perfectly fine for 10 or more years. And after the initial dehydrating process, it requires no electricity whatsoever. The cons, well, there's a little bit of prep time and quite a bit of actual dehydrating time, somewhere between 12 and 24 hours. And you have to rehydrate the corn before you can eat it. And because rehydrated corn is never quite the same as fresh, frozen, or even canned, it's best used in things like soups and stews. Pressure canning, the pros, shelf stable for a fairly long amount of time, one or more years, and neither the process or the storage requires any kind of electricity. And with canned corn, you can eat it immediately. Just open up the jar and dig in. The cons, it requires a bit of time and effort up front, and it requires a lot of resources in the form of energy for heat. Between sanitizing the jars and processing them in the pressure canner, we're using a high flame for well over an hour. So that's about it. Don't forget to like and subscribe and stay up to date on all our latest stuff. Thanks for watching, and until next time, this is Great Lakes Prepping.